In our first reading today, Ezekiel is placed down in the middle of a valley full of bones. In this vision from the prophet Ezekiel, he is led there by the Spirit of the Lord. And the Spirit then leads Ezekiel wandering through this valley where there are many bones. I like how Pastor Kildee talked about envisioning this, envision walking through the valley with bones all around. Ezekiel is surrounded by death and despair everywhere he looks in this vision. There are more bones. The field is full of the lifeless shards of a ruined nation. And to give a little bit of context, Ezekiel is a prophet in exile. The Babylonian Empire destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem just before Ezekiel was scheduled to become a priest on his 30th birthday. Many of his people were brutally killed, and the ones who were not killed were sent into exile along with the prophet Ezekiel. In exile, the Israelites are grieving the loss of loved ones, and they're mourning the temple and the ways that they used to worship God. They're afraid because they've disobeyed God, and in their minds, they're being punished for their disobedience. And God has left them to die and dry up. The Israelites in exile are people in despair. They cry out, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. They've lost all hope in a God that they feel like they have lost all access to. Today, more than ever, we know something of what it's like to feel this communal despair and loss, to see the dry bones all around us and feel hopeless as though all is lost. America has now officially surpassed the rest of the world in confirmed cases of COVID-19, and the graph is still rising. We have not yet flattened the curve. We are trudging through the valley of despair as a country. We have been exiled from our day-to-day lives. Exiled from our routines and comforts. Some of us have been exiled from alone time, and others have been exiled from the touch of family and friends. We are exiled from our temples and our church buildings. We are wandering in the wilderness of virtual worship. And in the midst of this exile and visions of the death and despair that surrounds him, Ezekiel demonstrates the faithful and dejected posture of not knowing. Even as a prophet, he does not have all the answers. When asked by God in his vision, mortal, can these bones live? His only response is, oh Lord God, you know. Ezekiel clings to the power and wisdom of God in the midst of destruction and despair. Not knowing what the future holds, but knowing that God will be a part of it. Knowing that God holds Israel in abundant mercy. Trusting that God knows what God can accomplish with the dry bones of his people. But Ezekiel doesn't know. And in his despair, all he has the energy to say is, Oh, Lord God, you know. And in our gospel reading today, we have the same sort of mourning and utter despair that we see in Ezekiel. You could go to the next slide. Mary and Martha are faced with the reality of death in the midst of their faith. Their beloved brother Lazarus has died. And even though they sent for Jesus, he was sick. While he was sick, Jesus did not come. Jesus delayed. While Jesus stays put, while he delays, Lazarus dies of his illness and is bound by the wrappings of death. When Jesus finally comes to the town of Bethany, Mary and Martha both cry to Jesus on separate occasions. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. These women cry out with both lament and assurance. They have complete confidence in Jesus that he could have saved their brother. And they are furiously let down by his absence that he didn't do it. They are, so, they are caught so deeply in wondering what if that they cannot even begin to fathom what's next. What if Jesus had come sooner? My brother would not have died. And some of the Jewish people gathered say, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? The faithful people in this story are so focused on what Jesus did not do. They're so focused on the what ifs. They're so focused on the fact that if Jesus 
that Jesus wasn't there, that they have no vision for a way forward with hope in his presence. They are so devastated by timing and death that they cannot begin to fathom what could be. We too have been caught focusing on the what ifs. What about the economy? We can't slow down. What if it's not that bad? We can't risk our normalcy as a precaution. What about Easter? Will it ever come? Can we really celebrate Easter apart? And we too know something of what it's like to be separated and experience delay after delay of not knowing how long this will last. Like Mary and Martha, we hold these conflicting feelings of both lament and assurance as Christians. This pandemic is horrific beyond words, and somehow we still know God is with us. We too are bound in this time, like Lazarus who is bound to death. We are bound to our homes. We are bound to our fear of being infected, and worse, our fear of death. As part of my training to become a Lutheran pastor, I did a unit of something that we call CPE. You can go to the next slide here, which stands for Clinical Pastoral Education. So one summer, I was a chaplain at Wake Forest Baptist Hospital, and that was by far the hardest summer of my life. I was assigned some difficult units and had some horrific on-call shifts. And I remember vividly the first death that I bore witness to in my first week at the hospital. I was called into a room where there were two adult siblings at the bedside of their dad. He was unconscious. And the nurses were preparing to remove the machine and the tube that was breathing for this man so that he could peacefully take his last breaths. The siblings had asked me to come and to pray with them, and they wanted me to stay with them in the room. So I did. After the tube was removed, we stood in silence at the foot of the bed for what felt like hours. And we watched his chest rise and fall and rise and fall. And in that moment, the one where the breath stopped, the siblings said their goodbyes, and they told me they were going outside to smoke a cigarette, and they quickly left the room. I remained at the foot of the bed stunned. And I remember so vividly the blurred look that you get after staring at something for a while. You know that look where your vision begins to blur. That look came over me and started clouding my eyes. And I remember seeing the mirage of breath, the mirage of life. I wanted so badly to see the man's chest rise and fall and rise and fall that my brain had made it happen. I was seeing breath. I knew it wasn't real, and yet it felt as real as my own breath in that moment. I knew the man was dead, and yet he felt alive to me in that moment. We need mirages of life right now, not false hope or misinformation, but moments where we see life even in the midst of the death around us. Moments where our brains trick us into hope for a fleeting moment. Mirages of breath, mirages of life. You can go to the next slide. I believe Ezekiel had one of these mirages of life in our first reading. In a valley of desolation and despair, God calls out to Ezekiel. In exile and hopelessness, God tells the people through the prophet, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. Breath, spirit, wind, they are all the same word in the Hebrew. And God gives them to us as a means of hope, as a means of life. Multiple times in this story, God says, I cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And again, God says, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. God gives breath to the unfaithful Israelites in exile. They are still in exile, they are still mourning, but they are reassured in the breath of God, of God's presence. Because God is present with them, even without the temple. Their dry, breathless bones can breathe and have hope again. We are in a time of holding our breath, and yet God gives us the breath of life. We are in a time of filtering breath through masks for protection, and God protects us with the gift of the Spirit. We are exiled from community and bound up in our own homes. And God's life-giving breath is with us. 
God gives life to all those in need. Jesus, promise, Jesus promises life in the face of death. Jesus says in our gospel lesson, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Jesus' presence does not stop death, not his death or ours. And yet death does not stop the eternity life that Jesus offers us. Jesus is not absent in suffering and death as he appears to be in our gospel lesson. No, Jesus endured suffering and death to give us life and to be with us in our suffering. We have a life-giving God who gives life to us in the here and now and gives life to us even in our death in the hope of the resurrection. In life, death, and suffering and despair, Jesus is there weeping with us. In coming late to raise Lazarus, Jesus does the hard thing. God does the hard thing in breathing life into the dry and dusty bones of a hopeless nation. It's harder to reverse destruction than it is to prevent destruction. New life is hard. Resurrection doesn't take away the pain and death of loss. Maybe we will see that in a new way this Easter. Resurrection overcomes death, but it doesn't prevent it. Resurrection is not new life like we see in a perfect newborn baby. Resurrection is renewed life. Renewed life out of death and destruction. Renewed life means that the scars of the cross are still present. Renewed life means things will not be the same as they were before. Renewed life means that the mourning that we feel and felt is still there and is still real. Jesus weeps. Because he knows the suffering of loss. He knows the pain of dying. He's frustrated that it has to be this way. Jesus knows that raising Lazarus will be the catalyst for his own death at the hands of the Roman Empire. And yet, Jesus, through tears running down his face, speaks the word of life. While we are in the valley of dry bones and bound by death to our homes out of fear, Jesus speaks life to us. In times like these, we must keep looking for the mirage of life. We must hold tight to a God who gives us breath. We must look with hope to the possibilities instead of getting bogged down in the what-ifs. We must cling to a Jesus who weeps with us in our suffering. In times like these, we are, giving, we are given the refrain of not knowing. The refrain, oh, God, oh Lord God, only you know. We're given this refrain to cling to with both lament and assurance. In times like these, the word of God brings life out of death. God is breathing life into our bodies that are longing for connection. Jesus will call us out of our caves to unbind one another in community soon enough. Life is here and life will come. Keep, keep breathing, beloveds. Amen.